my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul.
these words from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke of the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. We know a little about disruption these days, don't we? It has been a constant part of our lives. By mid-March, our lives look nothing like it did just a week earlier. In addition to the pandemic, we can also see it on the news almost any day between the political protests, protests and rampant racism in our country. We have been uncomfortable, restless, maybe even angry. Hopefully, we are also learning something along the way. Maybe we are learning that People are tired of established patterns and of the people that uphold structures and institutions of which they have grown so weary. Many are looking for something new to break through and many are longing for a time to return to something that feels like what they used to know. We want more than what we are being offered by many of our leaders, no matter which point on a spectrum you might find yourself. And so, out of anxiety or fear or longing or circumstances or all these things and more, people are drawn to disruption. Maybe the unnamed slave girl in today's text was longing for something more for her life. Maybe she was hoping for a disruption to come along. 
Perhaps that is why she followed along after Paul and Silas as they were trying to work. But that wasn't enough for her and her life. She shouted to all who had listened that these were men of God, offering a path to something new. In fact, she shouted this so much that the story tells us she annoyed Paul to the point of action. She aggravated Paul to the point of his exercising the spirit inside her and freeing her to live a new life. In the past, when I've read this story, I have lightly skimmed over the opening and jumped straight to Paul and Silas in their jail cell singing and praying until the earthquake happens. I realize now how much I have missed and who I have missed. I missed the story of the enslaved girl, the one who sets everything else into motion. You see, out of her disruption, out of her desperation for something different for her life comes a domino effect in the lives of others. After Paul heals her and she is no longer able to perform and make money for those who believe they owned her, she is cast aside. And the owners then turn their attention to Paul and Silas. They accuse them of causing a disruption in town and that they are advocating for unlawful customs. Really? They're just angry that, no, that they can no longer profit from this girl. So they bring false charges against Paul and Silas and another disruption occurs. In jail, with their legs chained, Paul and Silas pray and sing songs of praise and an earthquake levels the jail and breaks them free. They sang songs of truth to the powers that enslaved them, and miraculously, they are set free. And the jailer knows that if they escape, his life will be on the line. So he prepares to kill himself. And then the tables of power turn again when Paul tells him they are still there and the jailer is incredulous at this turn of events. And then he asks Paul and Silas how he might tap into this kind of power. And they tell him to believe in God and be saved. And he did. And another disruption ensued in the life of his family as the whole household became believers in the one true God. In the story, one disruption leads to several others. And ultimately, many people come to know and have faith in the living God. This story moves on quickly from its beginning. In fact, we don't even know what happens to the girl who sets this story into motion. What we know is that the disruption she started led to the conversion of many people. Her voice led to her healing, which led to charges against Paul and Silas, which led to their imprisonment, which led to an earthquake, which led to the conversion of a whole household. The spirit that possessed her spoke truth to power and ultimately walls tumbled and people were brought to faith. Rosa Parks, the mother of the civil rights movement, was one of the most important citizens of the 21st century. Mrs. Parks was a seamstress in Montgomery, Alabama, when in December of 1955, she refused to give up her seat on a city bus to a white passenger. She, no doubt, was tired, not just physically, but tired of the whole system of racial injustice, 
the bus driver had her arrested and she was convicted of violating a local ordinance. Her act sparked a citywide boycott of the bus system by Blacks that lasted more than a year. The boycott raised an unknown pastor named Martin Luther King Jr. to national prominence and resulted in the U.S. Supreme Court decision outlawing segregation on city buses. Over the next four decades, she helped make others aware of the history of the civil rights struggle. Rosa dared to speak truth to power by not giving up her seat, and the dominoes began to slowly fall, and others found their voices as well, and a movement took shape. One seemingly small thing can lead to another, can lead to another, can lead to another. What would a holy disruption look like for you, for your congregation, for your community? What imagination might be unleashed through God's spirit to speak truth to power? What if your congregation found some way to challenge what is acceptable, normal, safe, so that others might come to faith, might know the grace and love of God, might find the liberation they seek? Paul and Silas had a powerful word to share, and doors were opened, chains were broken, and people were set free. There are many things chaining people in our world. Lack of food, lack of affordable housing, lack of access to adequate health care, prejudices, racism, greed, fear. What truth do we have that needs to be given voice? And what fears hold us back from speaking? What would happen if we caused a holy disturbance? If you use the power given to you by the Spirit of God to speak truth, to be the voice for those who are not being heard, what might happen? And perhaps this time of disruption to our lives and our church community is a holy opportunity to reflect on what you are seeing, what you're experiencing and learning. Congregations have been given a gift, a gift to break free from old patterns, to disrupt what has always been, to now be freed for God's spirit, to bring new life and imagination. Maybe it begins with looking around your community and engaging in dialogue with others to discover the stories of the chains that exist, because they do exist, even when we don't see them. And the only way to see those might be by paying attention, by listening to the stories that we are offered from others. And what would happen if we chose not to participate in hate-filled speech and rhetoric and instead spoke of love, kindness, grace, and God's mercy? And if just one small action toward breaking the chains that bind happens, who knows what might come next? Maybe households of people eventually come to faith, or a movement that addresses racism gains new strength, or your congregation learns new ways of being faithful. One voice speaking truth may hold untold power. And in the end, perhaps, just perhaps, all people will know and experience justice and the God of freedom.
Sometimes the meal is fancy. Sometimes there's white linen on the table and comfortable chairs. And sometimes you sit on the floor with a pizza. Sometimes it's just chips and soda, whatever. Sometimes with Jesus, it's fancy. Sometimes with Jesus, it's not. I have to admit, I've always wanted to just sit on the floor in the aisle of the sanctuary in the middle of the service. I don't know why. I'm doing it now. The part I'm not going to film is me trying to get up. But I want to call you to the aisle, to the floor, to the table. Sometimes it's just those moments I think that Jesus longs for. Jesus wants you to talk to him like you'd talk to any of your friends. He already knows what's in your heart. He knows what your mind is saying, but, but I think deep down the companionship, the friendship, the, the part of just relaxing and chilling with Jesus is the part that appeals to him the most. Today, everybody is called to the floor. Jesus institutes an invitation to the entire world. Not just the Christians, not just the white folks, but everybody, everybody. God so loved the world. Now, is everybody going to say yes? Probably not. That's not our concern. Our concern is to make sure that everybody hears the invitation. And so, this is the invitation. To come and remember Jesus in the simplest, most regular way we possibly can. With bread and a cup. There's a little homemade tortilla left over from Cinco de Mayo. This bread is like the bread, the flat bread that Jesus had that he prayed for and he broke on the night that he and his disciples celebrated their Passover, their celebration, their Cinco de Mayo. But then he changed, he changed the lesson, he changed the story, he changed the script and he said, this is my body. Imagine, this is my body, given to you. Take this, know that it was broken for you. Know that I give it freely to you. And know that I want you to consume me, all of me, to be me, so that I live in you and you live in me, just as I, my father and I are one. During the same time, he took a glass, a cup of wine. He blessed it. And he said, now I want you to look at this as my blood. Blood always signifying a promise and a seal and an agreement. This promise is sealed in blood. It's sealed in my blood. The blood that is poured out for the redemption of the sins of many. Take this, drink all of it. Take this, eat it. But not only that, any time you get together with anyone else, any other place or time, if you do this and remember me, I will join you there. Father, we thank you for being with us wherever we are, at a table, on the floor, in the midst of a crowd, or all alone. We thank you for gathering us together even when we are not physically together, for healing us when we are sick. We thank you for the promise that you give us that you will always be there no matter what. And as we prepare to walk into a new world, we know that you will be there with us. And hopefully, we have used this time wisely. Hopefully, we have quarantined ourselves not getting weaker, but getting stronger, prepared to step into a new place, a new time, as new people with new people. Bless us as we continue to walk these days, carry us through. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Here, He is here. He has blessed us with 
His presence in this place We will not be the same Here, can you hear All creation sings The heavens glorify His holy name Now to the King Eternal Immortal And invisible To the only God in this place we will not be the same here can you hear all creation sings the heavens glorify his holy name now to the king eternal Oh, 